on your own machines. That is not strictly necessary to take something out of the tutorial, but if you want to, you're certainly welcome to. Um, you're going to need VirtualBox installed on your machines. If you haven't done so, um, you might want to just follow along by listening, because I've heard that the Wi-Fi isn't exactly excellent unless you actually have your VirtualBox binaries on your machines, but that actually was in the information uh, for the talk. I do have five USB thumb drives here for you. Uh, for those of you that want to follow along, I'm just going to put one in every row, and then I would ask you to pass them down. Oops. Here we go. And just pass those down, and uh, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes extra so, we, uh, so everyone can get this stuff installed. So we're going to get started at 10 minutes past the hour. And if you don't have those machines running by then, I would encourage you to just follow along the tutorial and then uh, duplicate the tutorial afterward in your office, wherever. These, uh, these uh, images are also available on Dropbox, and I will make those available to you after the talk. OK? And there's instructions for you that are on the, uh, on the screen here now. What you're going to have to do is there are two virtual appliance images on the USB drive. One is called Puppet OVA, and one is OpenStack OVA. The Puppet one, we only need one instance of. And uh, the OpenStack one, we need three instances of. And uh, they're going to be named Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And there's a little fix-up host script in there. You fire it up. You log in as root with the password of OpenStack, and then you run fix up host Alice, fix up host Bob, fix up host Charlie, re you reboot, and then you have those machines renamed, and they have the proper network configuration that we need for this tutorial. Okay? So that is going to be on loop here for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And if anything is unclear, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask. Okay, and again, if you choose to just listen and not follow along with the tutorial yourself, that is perfectly fine. You can do that. Um, this is purely optional. If you do want to follow along, if you do want to build an OpenStack cloud in an hour, then you're certainly welcome to do so. And of course, as always, Slides will be available um, not only on the conference website, um, but the sources for these slides are also on GitHub, and I'll be happy to share the links at the end of the tutorial. And for those of you that uh, may have brought their own uh, USB thumb drives, such as the one that were given to you by the friendly folks from HP, it would be great if you could create a copy of the thumb drive and then pass those, uh, pass those around as well, because that would uh, facilitate and speed up the process, specifically if we have 
Uh, some late arrivals after 11. It would be great if you could help those people out. Is that a USB 3 or 2? 3? Awesome. By the way, if you happen to be on a Mac, um, these machines are known to work. If you are on a Windows box, it has to be a, well, it generally, you would have to work on a 64-bit box. And um, if you're on Windows, your uh, virtual box networks will be named slightly differently. They will not be named VboxNet 0, 1, and 2, but they have some Windowsy names, but that shouldn't hurt you. There's USB sticks going around already. For those of you in the in the first two rows that were the first people to get the to get the thumb drives, did those virtual machines come up okay for you? Were you able to start it? No? Uh, okay. Well, you should be familiar with how to uh, import a virtual appliance into VirtualBox. If you're not on the VirtualBox file menu, there is a setting that says import virtual appliance. At least it does so in English versions of VirtualBox. And if, it, when you, if you want to import a virtual appliance, then you can you select the OVA file that you've copied onto your machine, um, and then you give it a name. And the Puppet one, you can leave unchanged. And for the OpenStack ones, it would be helpful if you named them Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Uh, and uh, there is a little checkbox that you can set that says reinitialize MAC address. And you want to do that for the OpenStack VMs. OK? And once that is completed, uh, you can fire them up. Uh, and when you fire them up, they should come up with a, uh, with a console prompt. And then you can log in as root with a password OpenStack. And then you, the, the thing that you still need to do is run the little fix a post script to set your host names and set a proper network configuration. Are you sure that device is working? And again, as a request for those of you who have already downloaded these files onto their laptops and do have a USB stick with you, it would be great if you could help out your neighbor by copying onto your own a USB drive and share with your neighbor. That would be fantastic. Uh, 
Uh, the files are available for download online on Dropbox. I'll be happy to share that after the, uh, uh, after the tutorial. Don't attempt to uh, download them from Dropbox right now. That's not going to work on a conference Wi-Fi network. Okay, and for those of you who have just arrived, um, as I said earlier, uh, we're going to give people about 10 extra minutes to get those uh, virtual machines up and running uh, on your desktops. Uh, so we are going to be starting the tutorial proper at 10 minutes past the hour. So if one of you guys has already set up everything and wants to grab a coffee or a water or a bio break or something, uh, feel free to do so because you're not missing anything. Could I have a show of hands, please? Who of you guys currently has one of my USB drives? I would just want to know where they are. Who has one of the five USB drives that I passed around? Oh, they disappeared that quickly? Come on, don't give me that. You have one? OK, so you no longer have it. Well, that was actually not the question. I wanted to know where they are now. I know where they were at some point, because they were in my pocket at some point. <laughs> yeah. I kind of hit a bottleneck. I don't have what? By the way, here's an offer. Um, I'm willing to pledge dinner for a person that comes up with a meaningful way of distributing about a gigabyte and a half of files to a room full of conference attendees in about 20 minutes. Um, the rules of engagement are all the equipment has to fit in cabin luggage, um, and it can't rely on a conference Wi-Fi. So if you come up with a fancy idea of maybe building your own, uh, I don't know, um, your own network, a BitTorrent swarm that is exclusive to the room full of attendees, or something like that, please send me an email. And if that's actually a workable idea that I can use at a conference, I will buy you dinner. I saw a hand. What's your suggestion? What is that? Well, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, make a share on a laptop and then share it off via NFS or a web server. Believe it, believe it or not, I've actually tried that. Um, and that's how you very quickly find out that the problem in conference Wi-Fi is actually not the internet uplink. Because if you then have attendees saying, this is a great idea, but I'm currently downloading at about 800 kilobits a second, it's going to take a while. So sorry, no dinner for you.
Okay, so again, for later arrivals, there are USB sticks, uh, USB thumb drives circulating. Uh, for those people that actually want to follow along with the hands-on setup, if you don't want to follow along with the hands-on setup, that's perfectly fine. You're going to take just as much out of this tutorial that way. But if you do want to follow along, please make sure you get those set up within the next seven or eight minutes, uh, because by that time, we're going to be starting the tutorial proper. And again, if you've already copied the files off to your own desktop or to your own laptop, and you have a USB thumb drive in your possession, such as the one given to you by the friendly folks from HP in your conference bag in Tint. It would be great if you could copy that stuff onto that thumb drive and share it with your neighbor. That would be utterly fantastic. Um, that is an option. The problem with that is uh, if it's an access point that is small enough to comfortably fit into hand luggage, um, it typically doesn't deal too well with about 120 or 200 clients either. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, re there's really awesome Wi-Fi equipment out there that can handle like 3,000 clients at a time, but it requires checking in. I, I didn't say this was easy. If it were easy, I probably would have figured it out by now, but uh, I'll be happy to crowdsource ideas on this one. Yes, you had a question? Uh, yeah, well, with Chrome OS, I know we have a brand that's coming out that people can, uh, right now we have uh, also a uh, Chrome OS that can be used And that would be local to the room? Uh, no, that would be, that would be installed coming locally, and now it's probably... Doesn't work. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't use something that works remotely and relies on a conference Wi-Fi. Sorry. The, the point was not having people rely on the conference Wi-Fi to connect somewhere. To download something. No, not download. Everything installation would be... That's even worse. Then I, need, then I need interactive access to a remote cloud over a public Wi-Fi, a conference Wi-Fi. Uh, it doesn't quite cut it either. Yeah, that's the old uh, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes, right? Okay, right, so for Mac users in the room, we actually have those files on AirDrop now. Um, are you running on a 32-bit Mac by any chance? Check on that. Can you click on that? Yeah, does it say anything? No. Check the advanced. It should highlight it somewhere. You'll have to go through those. I'd, I'd have to go through what the actual invalid setting is. Sorry. So, okay.
could I have a show of hands, please, just so I can get an idea how many people have actually gotten the virtual machines on their desktops, like copied the files over? Can I see a few hands there, please? Okay, that makes me happy. Out of those, if you're having a problem starting those virtual machines, scream really loudly now. Great. I know these people. Have you tried clicking into it? Are you sure that there is no window hidden somewhere that is waiting for input for, from you? I didn't say anything about Intel VT. I said something about 64-bit. That's all. OK. On neither of those boxes? Well, it, I, I know that this stuff generally works, so the only thing that I can offer you, it is very probably a local problem with your VirtualBox installation or with your setup. Uh, there are still some USB keys floating around, I'm sure. I don't have any left here because I've distributed them all. You need, to, you need to create three instances of the OpenStack one. Three instances. No, I don't have any left. They're floating around. From this one? From this one, you need three. They, they need to be named Alice, Bob, and Charlie. I do the initialize to all my address. Yes. Right? Okay. So, uh, one, final, one final round of instructions here before we actually get started. Um, what you need to do once you have retrieved a uh, USB thumb drive from either me or one of the friendly faces around you, um, what you want to do is uh, you want to uh, import those virtual appliances into VirtualBox. File, uh, import virtual appliance. Um, for in, a, in order to be able to actually do that and then get them running, you need three VirtualBox host-only networks. On Linux and Mac, those are going to be called VBoxNet 0, 1, and 2. You need to create one instance of the puppet.ova appliance and three instances of the OpenStack appliance named Alice, Bob, and Charlie. You reinitialize their MAC addresses. You then fire them up. You log in as root with the password of OpenStack. 
and uh, you run the root slash fix up host script with the parameter Alice, Bob, or Charlie, depending on which virtual machine you're on, you reboot, and then you're ready to go. One final time, copy everything over, start VirtualBox, create those three host-only networks, import one instance of puppet.ova, import three instances of openstack.ova, name them Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and uh, hit the reinitialize MAC addresses checkbox. Log in as root, fire them up, log in as root with a password of OpenStack and run the root fix up host Alice, Bob, or Charlie script, reboot them, and then you will be ready to go. Because that is exactly the state that my machines are in here on this, um, on this machine that I'm using here. Okay, so I'm gonna close that and we're actually gonna get started uh, with, the, uh, with the tutorial. Uh, before I actually dive into Kickstack and the stuff that we're going to be talking about for uh, the rest of these uh, one and a half hours, you might be wondering just who the heck I am. Um, as, uh, as we heard in the opening keynote on uh, Monday, we have over two-thirds of new attendees to OpenStack Summits. Could I have a show of hands for here as well? For whom of you is at the first OpenStack Summit? So that's about right. So that's, again, that's about two-thirds to three-quarters. Um, so um, while I'm a regular here, sort of, uh, you might be wondering just who the hell I am. Uh, my name is Florian. Uh, I am one of the founders uh, and a frequent instructor at uh, Hasdexo. We are a professional services company that focuses on OpenStack, on distributed storage, and high availability. And what we do is uh, consulting services, implementation, troubleshooting, performance tuning, and uh, we do a fair amount of training as well. Uh, the first link up here is, if you will, my corporate bio. Uh, the second one is a link to my Google Plus page, and uh, I am reasonably active there and would be happy to connect with you and hear from you there. Uh, my personal email address is there as well. It's easy to guess, florian at hastexo.com. I'm one of those strange holdouts that actually don't have a personal, don't maintain a personal Twitter presence, but we do have a corporate Twitter account, and that is Astexo. Uh, so if you want to uh, tweet out your thoughts about this tutorial, we'll be more than grateful uh, to read them. Uh, and another thing, and I'm going to put this link up again later on, uh, that I'd like to show you is academy.astexo.com, just in case you're interested about our training program please feel free to take a look at that as well. All righty. Um, for those of you who are reasonably new uh, to OpenStack, uh, just a very quick overview over the OpenStack architecture. Uh, again, a quick show of hands, please. Who of you guys has um, first touched OpenStack in the last six months or less? Who's really new to OpenStack? Nice, cool, that's about one half, awesome. It's always great to have new, new stackers around. Um, let me give you a very, very brief overview uh, over the OpenStack architecture uh, that we're gonna be uh, building here. I'm gonna start at the very bottom. Uh, we have in OpenStack a central identity service that we call Keystone. It is uh, responsible for not only maintaining user accounts um, and tenants um, and take care of uh, user authentication, authorization, and access control, it is through the tenant concept, the thing that we can use to segment our entire physical cloud infrastructure into multiple segregated walled off areas that we can then use on a per customer basis if we're a public cloud, on a per department basis if we're a private cloud, on any other um, sort of uh, segmentation that we need, uh, Keystone does that for us. Uh, we then obviously have a compute layer, uh, OpenStack Nova. That's the kind of stuff that actually runs and maintains our uh, virtual machines. We have our OpenStack image service, uh, Glance, that maintains the images that we uh, spun our, uh, spin our, our compute uh, guests out of. Uh, we can optionally store these images in OpenStack object storage, codenamed Swift, but we can also store it in a variety of other backend stores. Uh, over on the left of the slide, we have our OpenStack uh, network infrastructure, uh, codenamed Neutron. 
uh, formerly called quantum. Uh, the OpenStack networking ensures that not only um, individual virtual machines can talk to each other within the uh, cloud infrastructure, but also that we have connectivity to and from the outside world, such as, for example, the public internet. We have OpenStack block storage, codenamed Cinder. This provides persistent storage to virtual machines, to Nova guests. And then we have a unifying dashboard that we can use as our all-important GUI to manage all of this. There are two things that are uh, not included in this uh, overview here, which, is, um, which were new additions to OpenStack. And uh, those are the OpenStack orchestration layer, heat, and uh, the OpenStack uh, metering and monitoring infrastructure, Celometer, which is just left out of here to not clutter the picture too much. Um, from this, it follows that uh, we can introduce the concept of OpenStack node roles. Uh, no, OpenStack node roles are essentially logical, atomic, and composable classes of nodes, node meaning nodes meaning physical servers in an OpenStack cloud. Um, they are logical because um, an, an individual node role is typically an individual node role is typically not defined by the um, physical hardware that a specific node um, features, but rather by the services that are maintained by them. They are atomic in the sense that they are usually not broken down further. Um, that being said, just like we can smash atoms, there may be ways and means to, um, to break down these node roles further, but generally speaking, they're atomic. And they are composable, which means that it is perfectly possible for a single node, a single physical server, to hold several of these node roles at a time. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing in this tutorial as well. So let me walk through these really quickly. Um, one node role is what we call the infrastructure node. Sorry about this. Is what we call the infrastructure node. And an infrastructure node runs a database, a relational database. Typically, this is MySQL, but um, it could also be Postgres, or theoretically, it could be any RDBMS that SQL Alchemy supports. Um, and a message queue server. Typically, an AMQP server, typically RabbitMQ. There are other options as well. We can run Apache Cupid. We can run ZeroMQ. But by and large and by default, uh, it's usually RabbitMQ. This is also what we're going to be deploying this tutorial today. We have authentication nodes. Authentication nodes run the OpenStack Identity Service, Keystone, which provides authentication services and also, very importantly, a service catalog. That is to say, a list, a queryable list of API endpoints in the OpenStack cloud. API endpoints describe the services that are maintained by our API node. API nodes provide RESTful API endpoints to OpenStack services. As I'm sure most of you are well aware, all of the OpenStack services, Nova, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, Neutron, all of them, uh, provide RESTful APIs, which means essentially they're HTTP servers, and they're using uh, HTTP methods to, um, or clients use HTTP methods to communicate with them. And they're usually passing uh, JSON objects in doing so. Uh, the API node is the node type that provides these, and uh, it is very well possible that we have several API nodes such that we can provide a certain amount of high availability and automatic scale out. Then we have controller nodes that provide scheduling and registration services that are internal to OpenStack. Um, examples for controller services would be the Nova schedule, scheduler service, the Cinder scheduler service. Um, or, for example, the Glance Registry service. So those are backend services. And the reason why we are looking at this node type separately from API nodes is that a controller node can completely live in the walled-off management network. It needs no uh, connectivity, necessarily, to the outside world. Whereas in, a, in an OpenStack cloud, whether it is private or public, you typically do want to expose your APIs to the outside so that people can interact with the cloud programmatically. And uh, because of that, an API node always needs to live or at least be available or be reachable from the public network or from the network wherever your clients are sitting, whereas for the controller services, that is not the case. They only need to speak on the management network. 
Furthermore, we have network nodes. Network nodes provide network connectivity within the cloud and to public networks. And again, this is a separate node type because it usually has different connectivity requirements, such as a network node typically needs to be required, uh, needs, needs to be uh, connected to the public network, uh, such that your virtual machines can actually be reached by the outside and themselves reach the outside world. It's very, very uncommon to build an OpenStack cloud that is completely walled off within, say, for example, a secure service. There may be certain three-letter agencies in the United States and elsewhere that are known to run OpenStack, um, as we know from the uh, last summit, um, where this may be completely walled off and um, reporting on it might get you thrown in jail or at least held up in airports for eight hours. Um, but uh, it is typically very common for network nodes to be connected to the public network. And then we, of course, have compute nodes. Those are workhorses. Those are the ones that host and run virtual machines, or as we refer to them in OpenStack and Nova parlance as guests. So these are essentially our hypervisor nodes. Um, because of the way uh, OpenStack is architected, again, these compute nodes need no connectivity to the outside world. They need connectivity to the tenant networks, the networks that uh, we run our, for example, GRE or uh, VLAN tunnels in. We have uh, storage nodes that provide persistent block storage to guests. Storage nodes may either actually store uh, our persistent data themselves or may act as essentially uh, proxies to one of the about a dozen and a half backends that uh, OpenStack Cinder supports. Again, separate node type because it obviously has to listen on the management network so the internal API services can reach it, and it also has to listen on whichever network your storage infrastructure uses, which might be entirely separate from the one that is um, the rest of your cloud. And then we have a dashboard node or dashboard nodes, which provide a unified web-based user interface to cloud administrators and cloud users. Um, the dashboard node may well be the same node um, as your API node, so you might coalesce these two roles or compose those two uh, roles on the same node or as, uh, the same set of nodes if you're running it for HA or, or load balancing scalability purposes. Um, but it's sufficient to be um, sufficiently dissimilar from the API nodes to be considered a separate node type. Um, and then we have two, no two new ones, um, which is uh, due to the fact that the Celometer and Heat project just saw their first uh, release drop. Uh, we have a metering node type, or metering node role, which connects metering data from a unified event stream. That is what Celometer does for us. And then we have the orchestration nodes, which run the orchestration engine, the heat engine for complex guest workloads. Um, by the way, just as a reminder, all of those slides will be available later on, um, and they're also available on GitHub, so you might save your pictures that way. Um, so again, uh, metering node and orchestration node, these are new additions uh, in OpenStack since the Havana release. Prior to that, all of that was an incubation, and experimental, et cetera. And uh, let's take a quick look at uh, how this maps to our tutorial architecture. Uh, for those of you who have set up these virtual machines, uh, you are currently going to be running four different virtual machines. Uh, one's called Alice. Alice is going to be, and again, uh, as I said, it is very common uh, for multiple node roles to be composed onto a single physical node. Alice is going to be our infrastructure node, our authentication node, our API node, our controller node, our storage node, our dashboard node. And if we have time, at the end of the tutorial, we're also going to make it our metering and our orchestration node. If we don't have time at the end of the tutorial, you will be able to do so on your own. And I'm going to tell you, it's actually going to be simple. Then we have Bob. Um, Bob is our compute node. Bob's going to be the one that runs uh, our actual Nova guests. Obviously, this being a reference infrastructure, it's not necessarily anywhere near what you would see in production, such as it's relatively uncommon to have a single compute node in your entire cloud, right? Um, but in this case, to demonstrate the architecture, Bob is going to be our uh, one uh, compute node. 
And then we have Charlie, and Charlie is going to be our network node. Charlie is going to be the node that simulates our network gateway to the outside world. And then because we want to deploy all of this with Puppet, we have a node named Puppet, which is going to act as our Puppet master. Okay? Um, for these three, for Alice, Bob, and Charlie, what you have on those boxes right now is a completely bare Ubuntu 12.04 um, image, and the only thing that is not, uh, that has been changed from the original installation is I put on these little scripts in here uh, for, you know, fixing up the IP addresses and the host names, and they have uh, Puppet 3 clients, Puppet 3 agents on them. Um, Puppet is actually pre-installed. Um, it also runs a Puppet 3 Puppet Master. And it has a set of Puppet modules pre-installed that you can find, uh, or that are being developed on StackForge. For those of you unfamiliar with StackForge, StackForge is a sort of sister project to OpenStack. Uh, it is a collection of uh, sub-projects that are not considered part of OpenStack proper, but uh, that have the ability to use and work with the entire OpenStack uh, continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment uh, architecture. So anything that is being uh, managed on StackForge goes through the same Jenkins jobs, gate jobs, et cetera, et cetera, that also goes through OpenStack. And um, there is a collection of Puppet modules for OpenStack that is among the very, very many things that you can find on StackForge. Um, these modules were originally started by employees of Puppet Labs, but have since become a community effort, and there is a number of non-Puppet Labbers that uh, contribute to them, my team included. And uh, then there is a, the, another thing that is pre-installed on those boxes is something that we call Kickstack. It is a really, really, really thin wrapper around the, uh, puppet, the StackForge puppet modules. And the only thing that is meant to do is it simplifies and provides a little more high level of view uh, for deploying node roles to individual nodes. And if you want to take a look at that, you don't need to copy that off the slide. You could just snap a picture of this, and your phone will take you to it. So all of that stuff is on GitHub. The idea behind Kickstack is to make uh, OpenStack deployment easy for you using any Puppet ENC, an external node classifier. And that can be the Puppet dashboard, which we're going to be using here. It could be Puppet Enterprise, it could be the Foreman, it could be an ENC that you write yourself and that generates some YAML for you. Um, that's the whole point. Make everything configurable from a Puppet ENC. If you don't like ENCs, it's perfectly fine to do this in your Puppet manifest as well. Either way, if you go to this um, GitHub repo, there is a readme in there and there is a documentation in there for how to use it with or without an ENC. And uh, that creates our Puppet dashboard. Um, that's what the Puppet dashboard looks like, like right after starting. Um, depending on your individual um, configuration, you might be able to connect to the dashboard at, um, let's see, at this address here that you can see at the top, 192.168.122.100, port 3000. Or if that does not work for you based on your VirtualBox configuration, um, there is a port forwarding entry in your Puppet OVA. So you should be able to connect to this if you don't have a local firewall that's keeping you from doing that at localhost port 3000. Okay, so it should port forward that to you on localhost port 3000. This is what the Puppet dashboard looks like at the very start. Um, it is uh, completely empty, um, except for this predefined group here named Kickstack and all of these classes that we see down here. And now we're going to start building our cloud. Oh. Do, 
HK thing. Shark. I should actually start these things. And then this looks much nicer. OK, so this is my puppet host. And uh, here's my Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So those are the four boxes that we have. And you're, of course, welcome to uh, connect to these boxes either using the virtual box consoles uh, or you can also connect to them by SSH if your SSH setup or your virtual box setup allows that. Uh, so the IP addresses there are these. So that's Alice, that's 192, 168, 122, 111. And then there's Bob and Charlie that are 112 and 113. And the first thing that we're going to do on all of these boxes is we're going to quickly run our puppet agent. And then uh, this will connect to the puppet master. And uh, yes, for those of you familiar with puppet, you are now welcome to crucify me. The puppet master is actually set to auto sign SSL certificates. No, do not do that in production. But here for the testing setup, that's perfectly fine. So what this does is it has our puppet boxes or our puppet agents check in with the master for the first time. And if we do that on all of these, whoops. So that's that, and then we switch back to our Puppet dashboard. We should now see those three nodes checked in in a moment. Right now there are two, and there's Charlie, okay? So we've got all these three nodes, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. They've checked into the Puppet dashboard, and we're happy. Uh, and what we now need to do first is we need to uh, add all of these three nodes that have just checked into uh, Puppet dashboard to the Kickstack group. So over here, group, kick stack, edit, and then you add the nodes down here. And there is a nice uh, auto-completion thing that we can use for this purpose, Alice, Bob, Charlie. And there's one minor change that I need to make to my configuration here, not to yours. So what you want to do, just these three nodes, add them to the kick stack group, hit update, and then if you see the group named Kickstack, you should be seeing at the bottom here the nodes that are listed. So now we've told this thing that is just part of that group, but let's actually start installing stuff. And we're going to start with Alice. And uh, if I now add a few Kickstack classes to this thing, and I'm going to start with the infrastructure class and I'm also going to add the auth class. Save changes here. So this has now become a infrastructure and an auth node. And now we're going to go back to our node named Alice and run Puppet Agent again. Um, and then it's going to do some fancy stuff for us. Um, obviously, in a production setting, you wouldn't be invoking Puppet Agent manually all the time. Instead, you would probably have it running as a system service. Um, but what this thing is now doing for us is it's going to install a few packages. Um, it's going to add, in this case, the Ubuntu Cloud Archive. If this were a RHEL or a CentOS client, it would instead add the RDO YUM archives. One of the nice things about the uh, Puppet modules on StackForge is that they support three different distributions, namely Debian, Ubuntu, and, well, four, Debian, Ubuntu, RHEL, Fedora. Um, and um, we can use the same configurations for both of these platforms. They don't support SUSE, in case you ask. Um, I guess this is largely due to the fact that SUSE themselves for SUSE Cloud um, seem to be preferring Chef and Crowbar as a uh, deployment and orchestration scheme. You got a question? Your puppet node doesn't have a network. Hang on. 
Hang on a second. So if you don't have a network connection, please double check whether you have your host only networks configured, whether those are up. Um, if you don't, if you fail to do that, then as you bring up the machine, um, the um, puppet will give you a little warning, but if you, if you just hit OK on that, it will still boot and then we'll have no network connectivity. So if you uh, go into your VirtualBox preferences, do make sure that you have three, three different host-only networks. And if you are on, a, on Linux or on a Mac, those are going to be called VBoxNet 0, VBoxNet 1, and VBoxNet 2. If you don't have them, then those nodes are not going to have um, connectivity between them. Was that your question? Yes? Have, have, you tried, have you tried pinging Alice from Bob? No, the fixed IPs should work just fine, really. So one, one thing that might help you, although it shouldn't be necessary, is uh, if you want to clear out the UDEV rules for your networks and then just reboot. Um, that is in slash etsy slash udev slash rulesd 70 persistent net dot rules, I think, if I remember my Ubuntu foo correctly. Um, and by the way, our puppet node needs no connectivity whatsoever to the outside world. All the packages that we're going to be installing here are pre-cached on the Puppet node. It does not need to go out to the web. So the only thing that we need to make sure we have is actual connectivity between those two nodes. Uh, meanwhile, this thing has completed uh, its first Puppet run. Um, what has happened here, and I'm going to um, add a second one, what has happened here uh, before is uh, this thing has created in a completely hands-off fashion uh, all of the required uh, MySQL databases for all of these individual OpenStack services. Uh, it generates passwords for them um, and um, does not need to do any pre-population of those databases because that is something that all of the OpenStack services do uh, on installation uh, with their uh, various manage DB sync commands, where they just take their database schema that is defined in the ORM layer um, and uh, then go from there. So the question was, how do I add those nodes to the Kickstack group? Um, in the, in the uh, Puppet dashboard, the same thing would be true for Puppet Enterprise, by the way, there is a list uh, over here and it says group. And there is a Kickstack group in here. If you click on that, um, then uh, you're going to see a node list. By default, that's going to be empty. And if you hit edit, then here again at the bottom, you have a node list and you can add nodes here. And those are nodes that have to be previously, that have to have previously checked into Puppet. So again, on the left-hand side of your screen, group, there's a Kickstack group in there. As you hit edit, you get to this screen, and that has a nodes field where you can add your individual nodes. Oh, and that catalog run is finished. Now, with our first two Puppet runs, what we've done is we have created all of these databases, as we can see here, var, lib, uh, MySQL. There's a bunch of databases in there that have been created for Celometer, for Cinder, or Keystone, Nova, Neutron, whatever. Um, and we have also created a Keystone service. Not only have we created a Keystone service, but we have also created an admin user that we can use. 
And uh, because this is being nice to us, it has also dumped the credentials that we need for this into an OpenStack RC file. And we can now source this OpenStack RC file, and then we can, for example, do a keystone endpoint list such that we get a list of currently configured keystone endpoints. Um, and as of right now, that's going to be exactly one, namely the keystone service itself. Uh, so that's that. It has created a uh, keystone uh, service for us here. Uh, it is already functional, as we can see from the keystone endpoint list. We can also uh, list our tenants here. Those are the tenants, and it has created a few users for us. Most notably, the admin user in the OpenStack tenant that we're going to be using to interact with the system here. We're now going to continue by adding to our node Alice. Here's Alice. Uh, we're going to add two things here, which is we're next going to add the API class. Here we go, kickstack node API. And we're going to add the dashboard class, kickstack node dashboard. And if we go back to Alice and uh, do yet another puppet run, here we go. Then this thing is magically going to become an OpenStack API node. Uh, we have uh, fulfilled a prerequisite for this, which is we need a keystone services tenant. That's the one that you see at the top here. The services tenant is the tenant that um, individual OpenStack services use to authenticate with Keystone themselves. And uh, that is a prerequisite, so we need to have a Keystone endpoint, and we need to have a services tenant, and we need to have uh, Keystone users uh, for all of these services in that services tenant uh, that they can use. Those users are not listed in Keystone user list because by default that only lists our home tenant. Um, so all of that has uh, previously happened. We've got the users, we've got the databases, uh, we've got a Keystone endpoint. And the next stuff that we're going to do is we're going to uh, import, uh, I'm sorry, install um, all of these uh, individual uh, OpenStack API packages. So that would be Nova API, Glance API, Neutron Server, um, Cinder API, et cetera, et cetera, and also the OpenStack dashboard. Um, and that's a reasonably complex configuration. Uh, if you do it manually uh, with Apache and Django and, uh, and, and, and uh, the OpenStack dashboard itself, uh, Horizon, and uh, the, Puppet, the StackForge Puppet modules do all of that for us and make it very simple. Um, the one thing that I uh, failed to mention earlier is these uh, modules that are on StackForge uh, are also available on the Puppet Forge. The Puppet Forge is a collection of third-party uh, and Puppet Labs contributed uh, Puppet modules that you can install and manage on your Puppet infrastructure with a simple Puppet module install command, uh, which makes things really, really simple. Kickstack itself, by the way, is also up there. Um, however, I do need to warn you that um, the package on the Puppet Forge has not yet been updated for OpenStack uh, Havana because of some dependencies on um, current Havana issues with the Puppet um, StackForge, the StackForge Puppet modules. Um, so as this is chugging along here, um, as we can see, not only are the packages being installed, um, but they're also being configured. Um, one thing that just flew by here was the Cinder configuration. Now here's the Neutron configuration. Neutron in this um, setup is being configured in um, OVS mode. So it's using the Open vSwitch plugin, uh, using GRE tunneling. And um, that, uh, as we are going to see in a moment, is also going to be properly implemented on uh, the compute node and on the network node. Um, one thing that is uh, important to understand, and we're going to see that in uh, just a moment, is that the API services uh, that we're installing here are fundamentally independent 
from the services that the APIs manage. Um, as we're going to see in a little bit, we're going to be able to interact with these APIs even though there are currently no services at all that are implementing them. Um, the, uh, the idea is here, obviously, that this stuff is uh, at any time pretty much completely decoupled, but it has sort of the interesting side effect that you can have an OpenStack cloud that looks like it's fully functional, but it's not, as we're going to see in uh, just a little bit. So here's our Cinder API. All in all, this puppet run should take about four minutes or so on this hardware. On my, I'm running all of this here on one laptop. Um, if you're running this on uh, actual hardware, uh, you can generally expect this to be uh, quite a bit faster. For you guys in the third row, did those network connectivity issues resolve themselves? No? Okay. Um, I'll be happy to troubleshoot those after the tutorial. Um, and you should be able to, if you, if you follow along here, uh, the rest of the stuff that we're doing is essentially we're adding more and more of these classes, so you, it should be relatively simple for you to duplicate um, that uh, later on in the comfort of your home, your office, or your plane seat, which is what's, what comes closest to home for myself. I don't know about you guys, but uh, for me that happens to be the case. Uh, the steps are documented on, uh, the, in the uh, Kickstack uh, GitHub repo. Um, they are documented both for running with, a, uh, with an ENC, such as Puppet Dashboard. It actually explains how to run it with Puppet Dashboard. But it also explains um, how you would run it if you're running without an external node classifier. If, you, if what you prefer is just hacking a Puppet site PP manifest, um, you are certainly free to do so. And uh, you do have that option. It follows exactly what's in what's on GitHub, so there's no um, there's no specific uh, magic here. Okay, we're seeing a scheduling a refresh of the HTTPD service, so we should be uh, seeing a a dashboard relatively shortly here. Here's another thing where I guess I can't pledge dinner, but I can at least pledge a beer. Um, if you find out why my laptop has less I.O. when there is an external monitor plugged into it, I'll buy you a beer. This is a very, uh, a very special case of demo effect. Uh, the I.O. throughput on this thing is actually significantly slower if it is up on a lectern and it has an external monitor plugged in. I used to think it was an interrupt going crazy from the Wi-Fi, but killing Wi-Fi doesn't change a thing. Interesting stuff. Um, by the way, this is really nice about the, uh, about the Puppet, um, not only, that's actually not just the Puppet modules, but also uh, the uh, respective Ubuntu packages that we're using here. Uh, it will, uh, for example, do the DB syncs for you at the end of uh, installation runs. That is to say, it will uh, populate uh, the Cinder database uh, for you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, the the uh, the stuff. So what happens is. Someone at Puppet Labs takes the mo uh, a release manager at Puppet Labs takes the uh, modules from StackForge and builds a Puppet module and uploads it to the Puppet Forge. That's what happens. So the stuff the stuff that is currently in Git on StackForge is actually in really really good shape for Amana. So if you want to work with that, by all means, please do. And uh, we're always really really happy for contributions on those. 
So if you do find, uh, if you do find a bug, file it on the launchpad. If you can send the patch and upload that to Garrett, that's wonderful. Um, there are some really, really, really helpful um, Puppet developers that are working on this stuff. Uh, so, uh, for example, of a few people that I had the pleasure to work with when I started on this, uh, Joe Topchin from uh, Cybera was a really great help. Um, Dan Bodie, who uh, just launched his own company in his ex-Puppet Labs, was a really great help as well. So there's a bunch of people that you can talk to and that will talk to you and will help you out um, if you're willing to contribute. So, and that's still doing its silometer. Sure, any time. Yes. Sure. So there is, um, in, in, I don't know if, if that has ever gone out to all the attendees. There was information that did go out to the speakers. There is a site on um, the, uh, uh, there is a place on the OpenStack Summit site uh, that we can upload slides to. Uh, and uh, the stuff is being published, um, I think, at the end of every day. And I've seen individual speakers share their links, but I haven't seen like tweets go out to everyone where you can find the slides. Maybe that's sort of a miscommunication. I'll be happy to take that up to the, to the speaker manager. Um, but uh, that information is definitely available. All of the speakers for the summit have been, uh, have been encouraged to upload their slides or provide linked, links to their slides when they're hosted online. Uh, so yeah, all of that material is definitely available. Well, I just shared it with you. And uh, hang on one sec. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Huh? There you go. <laughs> I'll be back at that at the end. Yes. So currently, here's Alice. And it currently has these four classes here. Ah, finally. Okay, so in the interest of saving time, let me kick off my next puppet run straight away um, while, we, uh, while we're starting to, uh, to interact with these services. So we're going to add the rest of the services or the rest of the node roles that we want to add uh, to Alice next. And that is going to be controller and uh, storage. And that's going to be it for... Uh, for Alice, okay, and um, let's go back here real quickly, kick off that puppet run, and while we do that, lo and behold, here's our OpenStack dashboard, and uh, just for the heck of it, let's quickly copy our uh, OpenStack RC file 
from uh, Alice. So here's the generated password that we got here. And uh, we're going to use that real quick here. Uh, I'm going to use the user named admin. Oh. Yeah, whatever. Of course it has cookies enabled on it. Yeah, whatever. There we go. Um, so as you can see, um, even though we, we don't have any compute nodes, we don't have network nodes, we don't even have a Nova scheduler or a glance registry service, nothing, um, our OpenStack dashboard is already fully functional. And the reason for that is that because all of our APIs are already fully functional. Because as we can see here, from a keystone, uh, sorry, I need to source this, obviously. Here's my OpenStack RC. And uh, actually, let's head over to Alice here from here. And that is, of course, busy right now, but that's all right. If I do a keystone uh, endpoint list, As you can see, all of these API nodes, uh, all of these API services um, have been listed uh, for Keystone. Um, and all of these API services are currently um, already responding. Uh, so for example, if I were to do a Nova list, then it comes back with an empty list because I don't have any, uh, any computes, any guests currently defined or running, but the API service is already fully functional. The same thing, for example, is true for Cinder. Um, I don't have any volumes defined or anything like that. Um, so it's going to come back with an empty volume list. There we go. And if I do a Neutron net list, it is going to talk to Neutron, and it is going to come back with, a net, with an empty list of networks. If I do a heat stack list, then it's going to talk to heat and ask it about uh, whoops, that is probably currently uh, restarting, but that's okay. Um, and then uh, we can also do a glance image list. There we go. And it comes back with an empty list of images. Um, all the while, this is chugging along in the background, and... Um, here we can see those are various Nova services that are being installed. Um, and after that, we're going to see various GLAN services, and we're going to see various Neutron services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, that doesn't keep us from interacting uh, with all of this stuff already, which architecturally, I think, is kind of sort of cool. Um, and now, again, we're going to let this chug along here um, until we actually have a fully functional uh, controller node uh, that is also going to act as our storage node. And once we're done with that, uh, we can continue on with our uh, nodes named uh, Bob and Charlie. And they're only going to get one node role each, namely a compute node and a network node. Um, and uh, once that is complete, then we can actually start um, running uh, virtual machines on there. Um, so, yeah, and by the way, that was the reason why my heat call didn't work earlier, because heat was, had just been uh, stopped and then uh, restarted. Uh, and that completed a lot quicker here. Uh, and what we have here now is um, the controller node and the storage node is now essentially completely installed. Among other things, it also has a Cinder Volumes group that has been created for us um, in LVM. And again, in the interest of time, let me uh, kick off the compute node installation on Bob before we start interacting with our services on uh, Alice, or go back to interacting with our services on Alice. So I'm now going to make Bob my compute node, kickstack node compute. Oops. And then 
we're going to let Puppet do its thing. The first thing this does is it fetches uh, from the other node that has just been created a few pieces of information, such as, for example, where the heck is uh, my Nova API? Where is, uh, it needs to know a few, uh, a few passwords that it can connect to. And of course, it also needs the Ubuntu Cloud Archive because that's where it gets its uh, packages from. And like I said, just in case you're wondering, uh, Puppet is actually running a pre-populated app cache or ng service, uh, and, uh, a proxy, uh, so in offline mode. So uh, none of these uh, boxes actually need to connect to the internet to some Ubuntu uh, APT archives to actually fetch this kind of stuff. OK. And now that we have a full-blown controller node, uh, we can uh, start interacting with our cloud, and we can do so either on the command line or using the OpenStack dashboard. Just for a little example here, uh, if we go into, our, uh, into the tenant that we have just created here, um, we can take a quick look at, for example, our network topology. And as you would expect, our network topology is currently completely empty. There is nothing in there. Now, we could use the OpenStack dashboard to create a network topology and create some routers and do all that. But because OpenStack is um, meant for quick and massive cloud deployment, we can also do that in a scripted fashion. As it happens, there is a script here on your node named Alice, which when you've got your controller node installed, and you don't need a network node installed at this point yet. You just need the controller node and the API node. If you uh, source your uh, OpenStack RC here, OpenStack RC, that, oops, sorry. OpenStack RC that we created earlier. And then we do the little create neutron networks thing. Uh, then that will create a handy little network topology for us. There we go, there's a router, and there's a network, and there's a gateway, and woo, there is our network topology. So hang on a second, that should look slightly different. It should look like that, exactly. So we have an internal network that we're gonna call admin net. We're gonna have an external network that's gonna be our simulated public internet, and then we have something in between that we call provider router, which is a virtual router. And all of this is, of course, tenant specific, so um, this stuff exists for the tenant that we have just created. If we had a completely different user and a completely different tenant, it would not see this network topology and they would, create, would be able to create their own completely independently. Um, there's a few other things that I want to do that I want to be able to do when I, uh, when I ultimately launch uh, my compute infrastructure. In the meantime, let's take a quick look at how Bob is doing here. Um, that's still chugging along. Fair enough. And uh, there's a few things that I normally do um, in, a, um, in a setup like this. And recall, most of this is basically motivated by the training stuff that we do. Um, I like to add a flavor here. This is uh, something that, is in, that does exist in DevStack by default, but uh, it doesn't exist uh, in, in, uh, in a straight up OpenStack. I call this M1 Nano. It's a really tiny flavor. It's just one vCPU. 256 mega RAM, and uh, I'm not going to use any specific uh, non-ephemeral disk storage here. And I can create this flavor. There's my M1 Nano flavor, and I'm going to start using that in a moment. Another thing that I want to be able to do um, is connect to my uh, guests that I'm about to create via SSH. So um, what I want to add here is my own SSH key pair. And I can do that here in the Access and Security tab under Key Pairs. And uh, what I'm going to use is just my standard SSH key pair, SSH add-l. There we go. That's my SSH key that I want to import. There we go. Import key pair. I'm going to be really creative and name this Florian. That's that. Imported my key pair. Um, 
And I guess that's about it. Let's just take a quick look whether that key pair is in fact there. So here's a key pair list. There we go. That's the key pair that I've just created with that fingerprint. And uh, another thing that I want to do is um, I, of course, want to upload an image into Glance that I can then use. Um, you could use any old image that you like um, that works with OpenStack. So for example, you might be using the Ubuntu cloud image or something else. Um, what I tend to use is uh, Cirrus. Cirrus is a super tiny image um, that is only about 12 meg in size uh, that uh, does know about cloud in it and can therefore run in uh, an OpenStack infrastructure and be configured properly that way. Uh, so what I want to do, and this also was on the, on the USB thumb drive, just so no one actually would have to download it from the internet. So I'm now going to create this image here. I'm going to call this Cirrus. And uh, my image source is going to be an image file. And that is going to be, where are my cloud images? There's my cloud images, and that's my Cirrus. Upload that. That is a QCOW image. And we can go ahead and create that. This, by the way, is a very interesting pitfall. If you have a Glance API service that is running, so the OpenStack dashboard can connect to it, uh, but you have no Glance registry and you have no working store behind it, you can still upload an image through the dashboard, and it will actually say, thank you, I've queued this image uh, for you, and then there will be no trace of it ever anywhere, because it is the Glance registry image that actually stores the image metadata in the database, and then uh, that is being retrieved via the API. Um, so that's an interesting pitfall, um, which is um, something that people sometimes find uh, surprising or frustrating. So let's see how Bob is doing. Ah, that's still going strong. The thing that, it, uh, that that has to do here is because we are on Ubuntu 12.04, uh, Ubuntu 12.04 uh, shipped with a kernel that did not include the uh, OpenV switch data path module. So they had to ship that as a uh, DK mess module. So basically that means every time you're installing this, um, it's actually building uh, something for you here. Um, and that is probably going to take a few more minutes. So let me try and do something here. Let's see if this actually turns any better. If I just if I just kill this thing, oh great! There we are. There we go. Wi-Fi. Why is that in use? You are off. That's like totally not cool. doesn't like me. Um, OK, well, it's progressing. And that is our Nova configuration. So let's go ahead here, progress with Charlie, and actually complete the configuration, or complete the install part of the configuration, at least. There we go. Here's Charlie. And uh, Charlie, we are also going to add to 
to the, we're going to add the kickstack node network class here. In the meantime, over here, our glance image list. Oops. Glance image list. Should show the new image here that we have. There we go. So that's the series image um, that we have just created. And another thing that we can, of course, already do is we can create a volume here um, in Cinder because ultimately we want to be able to provide uh, persistent storage uh, to our machines. So we're going to create a volume here real quick. And uh, we're going to name the volume tests. And uh, that's just going to be, say, one gig in size. It's not going to come off of a snapshot or anything. It's just going to be a standard issue volume. And that is our volume that is now available. And as we can see here, um, not only do we see the volume in here, uh, we also see that volume here in uh, our LVM volume list. And of course, this is also being exported from uh, the iSCSI target. So in this case, we're using the standard uh, Cinder backend with LVM and iSCSI. And uh, under the hood, it does all the magic for creating this volume, uh, creating a target, and actually um, exporting it on the iSCSI portal. So Bob is finally done installing um, the, um, the compute stuff. And uh, now we're going to let Charlie become our network node. And then we can actually get going. One thing that this does for us, which is helpful on the compute node, it creates uh, our open, our open vSwitch -switch, v uh, virtual switch for us. Um, the configuration that this does is it uses a what it calls integration bridge. This is the stuff that we uh, put our uh, individual uh, VMs interfaces, VM ports in. And uh, it creates a tunnel interface, which is the stuff that, through a GRE tunnel, um, creates network connectivity between compute nodes and between the compute nodes and the network nodes. That doesn't look very spectacular right now, because we only have one endpoint of the tunnel configured. But as we're going to see, once Bob completes, uh, we're going to have the the other end of the tunnel configured as well. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with GRE tunnels in Neutron, um, they essentially build a full mesh of GRE tunnels between individual uh, compute nodes and the network node. And that acts like a, a gigantic virtual switch where from anywhere in the cloud, I can plug a virtual machine in. Um, the what I, what I should mention is for those of you who are planning to deploy this in production, do reconsider that. Um, OVS with GRE tunnels is, does not scale astronomically. Um, for example, if you're, we've seen um, issues with that, with networks that were running upward of, say, 80 tenants or so. Um, so the issue is not really that, it's not really that much of how many hosts or how many guests you have. Uh, but how many guests are running in how many tenants? Uh, because that is how the, uh, the network segmentation works. And um, there are, of course, other options that are available for you, such as, for example, you might be using um, 
you might be using the Arista backend, or you might be using uh, even the Open vSwitch backend, but not with GRE tunnels, and instead using VLANs. Um, there are several options there uh, for you to choose from. Okay, and here's uh, Charlie that is uh, chugging along with Neutron. So let's take a look at how that's doing with uh, Open vSwitch. Hasn't built the tunnel yet. Um, and now what this does uh, for the network node is it provides uh, not only network connectivity within the virtual network, but also to the outside world. To that, ex uh, to that end, it has a separate bridge, as we're going to see in a moment. On Bob, this is on the compute network. It has the integration bridge, and it has the tunnel bridge. And as we're going to see on Charlie in a second, um, there is also an external bridge. That's the bridge that maintains connectivity to the outside world, to the public network. That's a bunch of neutron here. And again, this is doing the OVS install here. In the interim, nothing has really changed in, um, in the OpenStack dashboard, except that we should see our, oh my God, I see that here. There we go. Uh, we have uh, seen Bob pop up as a compute node. Um, the dashboard gives us some info here about uh, what is the type of the hypervisors that we're using here. Um, obviously, uh, OpenStack Nova uh, supports a multitude of backends by now. Um, arguably, the one that you will find out the most in production is the one with Libvirt and KVM. Um, Zen is also very well supported because most of the Rackspace Open Cloud standardizes on that, um, as is well known. And there are other hypervisors that are supported, such as Hyper-V, uh, such as uh, ESX. Um, there is ongoing work with uh, LXC containers and uh, several others. Um, Here is a list of all of the services that are currently exposed uh, in the OpenStack dashboard. So that is effectively the dashboard equivalent to Keystone endpoint list. And what we can also see here are the various uh, Nova services, the various compute services uh, that are running. As you can see, there is a handful of uh, Nova services that are running that are part of the controller node, uh, such as Nova Console Auth, uh, Nova Conductor, Nova Scheduler, and Nova Cert. And then we have the actual Nova Compute service that runs on our node named Bob. Um, and we have network agents that are running on our node named Charlie. Does that mean that Charlie is actually done what it's supposed to do? Yes, it is. Beautiful. And um, we can now see that here, the OVS via CTL is suddenly becoming a little more interesting. It has created the tunnel for us here. That's the GRE1 tunnel up here. So we now have a fully working virtual switching infrastructure that we can now plug um, the system into. What this has also created for us is a set of IP network namespaces, which we're going to be using for logical network segmentation on this node. And now that we have gotten this far, let's go ahead and actually use a dashboard to fire up a virtual machine. So we are going to launch an instance here. And we're going to call this Cirrus, Cirrus 1. There we go. I want one of those. I want to boot that off of the Cirrus image. There we go. Access and security wise, I want to use my key pair. I want to uh, put that into the admin network. And now I'm going to launch this thing. Now, once that launches, so what happens now is, of course, we're pulling, those, uh, we're pulling that image over to the other node. We're uh, assigned to the compute node. 
we are assigning um, a IP address and then it is here and we can take a look at the console here. So that machine is now booting here. And we can also check out the log. As I said, this is a minimal cloud image. Pretty much the only fancy thing that it is capable of doing is uh, it actually talks to cloud in it. As you can see here at the end, uh, and it runs cloud in it and as such as is capable of uh, connecting to uh, the Nova Metadata API service. As you can see at the very bottom here, um, it just connected to a Nova service here at uh, a magic IP. There we go, and that is our completed Cirrus. And uh, what we can do here to this instance now is we're gonna quickly associate a floating IP from the external network. We can allocate that. We're gonna associate that with our Cirrus box. There we go. And there's our machine. That thing actually runs on the cloud. That is our Cirrus host. Um, I just connected to that using the SSH key pair um, that I previously defined. This is the uh, IP configuration um, as we would expect, 10553. That is the IP address that we uh, just uh, received from uh, Neutron. And we can also do a quick cat proc partitions. That's just a single disk here um, that is uh, currently available. So let's go here, use our volume, and attach that to this instance. Say we attach it as dev VDB. That volume is now attached. Let's see if it really is. We heat, there's a VDB. And let's create an EXT4 device on that thing real quick. And let's mount that. And now we're gonna do an echo Hello world, sudo t slash mnt foobar. So our mnt now has a file in there that's called foobar. And we can now unmount this thing, go back to our dashboard, create a new instance called Cirrus2 boot from the same image, da, 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 same thing, same thing, admin net launch. Oops, must select an image, of course. There we go. And that's our next instance. And that was, of course, a little quicker because it didn't have to uh, fetch the image again. Let's take a look. That should be on the same network. No, oh, there it is. That was fast. Oh, that doesn't have an SSH server. Not yet. Come on. Yep. Oh. 
There it is. Okay. And uh, let's see, how is the proc partitions doing on that one? Okay, there's only one. So how about we go about that? And we're not going to detach that. Boom. That is now available again. Attach that to Cirrus 2 instead. Dev BDB. Ta da! And there's our foobar. And that's the persistent volume for uh, the other box. And we can now play with things like disasso dissociating uh, floating IPs and reassociating them to the other box, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do pretty much everything that we want to do uh, with an OpenStack cloud. So that was like, now that's one hour and 20 minutes with me doing lots and lots of talking, going from completely from scratch, bare Ubuntu to a complete OpenStack cloud. Um, I could go on, but we're unfortunately out of time with the um, metering and orchestration node, just in case you're curious and you want to do that. It's a simple means of adding uh, the Kickstack node metering and or Kickstack node orchestration class to your node named Alice. So that would be here, and then another puppet run, and you should be there. Just to wrap up, um, if you happen to like this talk, it would be great if you could let us know on Twitter. Hestexo is the handle um, that you want to uh, tweet to. That would be great. For those of you interested in the slides, this is the link to uh, the GitHub page where you can find uh, the slides for uh, this presentation. I hope that's large enough for everyone that the QR code actually registers properly. Um, from what I've heard, this works really well with Google Goggles. And uh, just in case you are interested in learning more about this, I would encourage you to do take a look at uh, our um, Estexo Academy schedule. If you're based in Europe, we happen to have classes coming up in Munich. If you're based in India, we have classes coming up in Bangalore. If you're based in South America, in which case I would really not envy you for the trip that you made over here, we have classes coming up in Sao Paulo. So just in case. This one? Certainly. I will be happy to leave that on. Um, I'm going to hang around for another about uh, 20 minutes until I need to run. So by all means, if you have more questions, feel free to grab me. Um, this concludes my talks at the OpenStack Summit. So as of right now, I am a summit attendee, just like you guys are. I'm going to enjoy, enjoy that massively. And I hope you're going to do the same thing. I wish you a great remaining day and a half at the OpenStack Summit. And uh, it would be great if I could see some of you again, either in Atlanta or in Paris next year. Thank you for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>